OK, you can hear me OK? Is this on? OK, perfect. Yeah, um, an inverse evaluation of Netflix architecture using ATEM. Um, I'm, technically, I'm from Austria, but the difference here is not that important, I guess. Um, <laughs> I work in Germany and we have a consulting company there um, who is focused on software architecture. So we go in projects as software architects. We consult software solution enterprise architects. And uh, what we do lots of times is also uh, architecture evaluations. Um, and we uh, do that. Besides, um, we also uh, consult companies in moving towards microservice approaches. Um, and this talk somehow combines these two uh, elements, um, trying to evaluate what a famous uh, microservice uh, implementation actually does. Um, we have this here. Who in the room knows this picture? OK, the other ones are tired, I guess. Um, this is uh, the conceptual flow of what, what ATEM uh, actually looks like. Um, there's a, um, a source down there. Um, the conceptual flow um, actually comprises of a business um, detailing, of architecture detailing, an analysis step, and then getting out um, outputs. And these outputs are trade-offs, sensitivity points, risks, and non-risks. I will not um, go into much detail about this because we didn't do that. Um, we actually um, did an inverse atom. Um, and inverse, this sounds like a set thing now, but actually it's a pretty ad hoc uh, thing we came up with. Um, what actually works when you analyze a system that is out there um, it, where you don't have any stakeholders you can ask um, um, and where you want to uh, get different results. What, diff what still works is Um, the architecture stuff or the, or the architecture side of the story. Um, so detailing um, what architectural plans, decisions, and approaches actually are. When we look at Netflix, um, we have uh, lots of presentations, we have blog entries, we have articles, we have open source projects um, that actually give us lots of information. Um, they, we have live code, we have um, the technology they use, we have languages they use, we have patterns, we have concepts um, that um, we can observe. Um, and we also get a, a grasp on what the rationale be, be behind um, certain decisions were. Um, we, um, in, in their blog posts, they um, often describe what their choices were and why they took this before uh, another choice that they could have done, or another option they could have done. Um, so um, this is one thing where we get the rationale part. We also um, see a little bit of bit um, um, about the priorities they have um, if they open source something, um, they open source it in a state that is presentable. Um, so they can't actually open source everything they have. Uh, so the first things they uh, actually open sourced were the good parts. Um, and the good parts are most probably the important parts. Um, and so um, we can uh, somehow um, get a grasp on what priorities actually were for them. Um, we. Well, now we're in evaluation. We uh, went from there um, uh, and we went straight to the analysis bit. And the analysis bit is something that was um, kind of different to what um, normal ATEM feels like. Um, we asked ourselves, well, um, we want to uh, well, we see this architecture um, that they have and we want to um, know something about the trade offs. So um, we say they have great XY, great scalability, great robustness. Um, what did it cost them? So what are the downsides? Nothing comes for free, right? Um, so uh, when they have great scalability or great time to market for new features, something that they advocate, what is actually the downside of this? So we actually searched for these trade-offs. Um, we um, looked at ourselves and said, what is significant for them? What are they presenting all the time? What, what do they say that new developers need to know? This should be something that is very sensitive to them, um, something um, that could be a sensitivity point. Um, and then we mapped it to projects that we um, actually um, often see in banks and insurances. And we also have customers that work with, with devices. And we ask ourselves, would it work in their environment? And most probably wouldn't out of the box, uh, but there are bigger problems and uh, not so big problems. So uh, we get a little bit of an idea uh, what the risks and non-risks are here. Mm. What comes then is perhaps the most interesting part of the reverse or inverse uh, evaluation. Um, we um, actually um, 
did take the, the architecture and the trade-offs and the risks that we, um, that we found and said, well, if we have this thing um, and we want to reverse engineer what the goals are, what is the ideal context to make such an architecture work? And um, what um, do we actually uh, need for business drivers, for constraints, for um, everything um, to make uh, the trade-offs uh, in sync with these preferences? What do we need to make the risks not matter that much? Um, and what, what do we need to make the sensitivity points not hurt you so that they don't cost you uh, um, much money or that they are in sync with your culture and stuff? Um, and this is uh, something what we did, and um, actually I striked through the source part because this is something entirely different than uh, what's on the, uh, on the source there. This is not uh, the ATEM picture net anymore. So the most important part that you're asking yourself perhaps right now um, is where are you lying to us when you said in the talk title this is an inverse evaluation of Netflix? The answer is yes. Um, this isn't ATEM. It's uh, using bits and pieces uh, of ATEM, and it's not completely inverse. It's some parts are uh, regular steps, some parts are inverse. Um, but um, our findings were pretty good. Um, we actually, um, it helped us, or helped um, us with customers to feel, um, to, to, to have meaningful discussions about microservices other than, um, well, this is cool, or we want to do it, or um, they are successful, or um, this is all not working for us because they are so simple, or something like that. Um, they um, help to decide if some concepts that Netflix actually uses are suitable for your own context. So um, perhaps the information helps you there a little bit. Um, they highlight what the biggest challenges are, um, and they um, so far align with the um, with the. Um, observations we make in projects where we actually migrate to microservices. So um, we run into the, the, the pitfalls or we run into the context problems that we actually predicted in this uh, evaluation. The original one is from 2014, um, so we have two years of experience working with microservices since then um, on, on our side um, to actually account for the, um, for the um, details we, we got out of here. So Netflix. Who in the room knows Netflix? Okay. Uh, I saw somebody, uh, uh, some hands uh, stayed down. So the, the, the most to the point definition that I have is Netflix is the king of online streaming using more global bandwidth than cat videos and piracy combined. This is, <laughs> this is uh, like the, the mother of definitions. Yeah? Um, so what you get out of it is Netflix is big. Um, how big? Um, they have 600 services. They have billions of requests per day. Um, they have uh, about 2 billion hours of films and TV series, not in every country, um, but when you n know something about VPN and stuff like that, it's, you're getting close, perhaps. Um, they have 10,000 of EC2 instances, Cassandra database with multi-region global ring, terabytes of data. This is actually not the film data. Um, this is just logging and monitoring data um, that makes terabytes of, uh, of data there. Um, some um, guys at Netflix are choking that Netflix is actually a logging service that accidentally also plays videos. So um, <laughs> this is the logging part. Um, at peak, one third of the internet bandwidth US downstream. Um, well, that's uh, kind of impressive numbers. Um, how does it feel to have 600 microservices? It's like this, only more complicated. Um, the green boxes here are actually the services or applications as Netflix calls them. And for simplicity reasons, the redundancy is not shown. So every type of service is only once on this picture, so you still can make sense of it. Um, and the blue lines are calls uh, between these services. Um, we have um, one, is actually an older screenshot from AppDynamics. Uh, AppDynamics does a better job now to depict um, how uh, services interact in these environments, but uh, the, the tools weren't kind of built for this type of scale um, on, on, on services. Um, what's apparent is um, that this isn't simple or easy. Um, it's as complex as um, complicated domains that I see in banks, uh, for instance. Um, I, uh, I don't know who was in the talk of Patrick Kua two days ago. Um, he showed a, a picture of a um, big ball of mud who actually looked like this. Um, so um, you could argue that this looks a little bit like a big ball of mud. Um, 
but it isn't. Um, so these are three things that you perhaps get out of this, uh, out of this picture. Why isn't this a big ball of mud? Well, in principle, um, when you have a layered architecture, you have standardized technology, standardized databases, you have perhaps a canonical data model or something. Um, and um, in uh, microservice approach, you move to slices or verticals. And these verticals are actually what is uh, the green part in the picture before. Uh, so the, the, the green boxes are self-contained uh, systems that own their own data. Uh, they are independent of the others, uh, other services, even at runtime. So when another service isn't there or isn't present for a call, um, the service still functions. The customer, of course, um, uh, sees that not everything is working uh, right now, not every action is uh, working, but the service itself is not dependable. So it can um, actually evolve without um, in, in, uh, influencing the others. Just to get an idea of granularity um, that we have here, uh, I have to... Um, the, the, the starting page or the, the search page um, in a browser. Um, and we see se certain uh, several services on this picture. Um, when we start in the upper right corner, um, we see a search bar um, with, which obviously has a ser search service behind it, something that is good at searching, perhaps with a database or a data representation that is good for reading data. And it could be a very different representation of data than any other service has. Um, we also see a, um, a bell there, which could be a notification service. Um, so I guess uh, this notification service should, could also be something that is in there. Uh, we have uh, an autocomplete service. And this autocomplete uh, stuff could be separated from the uh, search service. And then we still have a great area here um, where there's a grid. Uh, Netflix calls it a grid, uh, where movies are actually presented. So um, this Grid is an, um, an interesting bit because um, when you look at the screen and look at the titles, you don't go row by row, left to right. So um, this isn't the order that is actually is the, the order when uh, it, it comes back from the database. Um, actually, this one is pretty unimportant, perhaps, because it's something that the eye catches pretty late uh, because when we go in a set way uh, uh, over the screen. So um, the the... the, the order in which the titles are presented is something uh, that is engineered, that uh, changes when you get UX feedback where the people look at and stuff. So the presentation of search results is something entirely different from the search itself. Um, and um, when we uh, saw the talk yesterday of Daniel Jackson, he said, uh, one purpose for one concept. This is uh, an exact implementation of this uh, being the search is the search and uh, the presenting of the result and the order in which um, they should uh, be presented is something different and it should evolve differently. It should, it should be something that uh, could be changed in a different, um, in a different scheme, in a different um, frequency. So what do we get when we look at these many services? I have uh, some slides where I have this trade-off uh, plus and minus side. Um, I will skim through them uh, pretty, um, pretty fast. Um, what we have, um, of course, is um, the thing with maintainability. You have small parts, they are small enough to be understood, so somebody who works in the search uh, field is able to do his search stuff without being influenced by any other. He can uh, change his data representation without, without um, having a conference with, with, everybody, with every other uh, technician at Netflix. Um, so things are relatively easy to change and you have low coupling between services and teams um, as these blue arrows are not dependency but only call relationships. Um, you have good time to market because it's not hard to add something um, to, to a system like this and you can uh, scale independently. On the downside, you have lots of things like complexity, testability, observability, reliability, everything that becomes more, more, more um, um, important and uh, difficult to, to, to achieve. This is actually not a neck breaker for most systems, but it's going to cost you. Um, and actually, Netflix invest, is investing a lot um, to get these downsides um, not, to not hurting them. Um, so um, the complexity uh, part is perhaps something that they give up to. They say, well, we can't manage, so we don't manage. Um, the other parts are something where they invest lots and lots of money to actually um, get the downsides um, into grasp. When we look at the organizational side, 
Um, we have teams that are fully responsible for these services. And um, this is something that is uh, also hard to grasp. And uh, whenever I show this uh, slide to a management uh, crowd, um, there's a, a certain kind of sigh going through the room. So, oh. um, so development is um, responsible. Uh, teams are responsible for development, for release, deployment, and also ops. Well, not for the system administration or something, um, but um, they are responsible for everything that happens inside a container. So when you can't stop and start it again and it works then, then the developers are uh, the ones that are responsible for fixing it. Um, there is no classical management steering and uh, the dependencies from um, uh, one team to another should be as little as possible. That also means little technical rules and um, uncoordinated releases. So there's no, uh, nobody who coordinates 600 services, um, uh, which is kind of hard task to do anyway. So the organizational principle behind it is called freedom and responsibility. Um, and the people that are freaked out about the uh, slide before are forgetting the responsibility part. This is not only freedom, right? Um, so um, the responsibility part is something that is very important here. Um, when we look at Netflix or what um, actually comes out of it, we see several pl platforms, um, not too many actually. We see um, a couple of programming language uh, and several persistent technologies that are actually in use um, in, uh, in, in their systems. Um, and um, even that there's a, a great number of, of different programming languages, the vast majority is written in Java, actually, more than 90%. And um, we'll see in, in a second why that is. So the freedom and responsibility part, um, of course, um, you have uh, um, the good sides, which is uh, new technologies and frameworks are easily tested in an isolated environment by one team. Um, and it's a local experiment. And it's something that is uh, tested in reality. So you really have real feedback before going to another team and saying, well, that's great. Um, on the, um, uh, uh, second thing that is cool is um, that the technology stack can evolve. Uh, so it's not a big bang to actually change a database technology. You can uh, try out a new database technology on one side of your system, see if it works. And with this, this benefits, you can go to other parts of your system. Um, and uh, it potentially uh, can improve any quality because the, the autonomous teams can optimize for their use case. They can use the technologies the need uh, to actually make a fast search to make um, um, uh, um, a, p a performant um, uh, uh, combination or something like this. So on the downside, of course, centralization is hard to do. Uh, it's hard to have a central plan and push it down on people. Um, and this is a cultural thing that is often very, very hard to do in, in, in a, in a uh, concern structure or something like that. So um, the time to market is something that is uh, sometimes uh, uh, also on the bad side because new technologies, um, you can't uh, build on stuff you already know. You have to evaluate the new technology. So um, this could be something that is um, uh, problematic. And the complexity is also something that, uh, that comes into mind. To mitigate a little bit of these uh, downsides, um, there comes the responsibility bit. And this is uh, something that I find quite important. Um, you have to get developers in touch with their responsibility. So um, one thing that um, Netflix does is that they have tests for quality criteria. They don't call it that way, but um, they test for latency, robustness, reliability, scalability. They have all kinds of monkeys and the Simian army to test reliability. Um, and nobody is able to actually put something in production and keep it there if it doesn't adhere to central quality criteria. So the responsibility is kind of uh, a very important thing here. Um, you want to give um, people a fine-grained feedback and an early feedback. So when somebody pushes code, um, then he immediately gets feedback if the um, quality criteria, if they are met, if they are not met, and so on. Uh, and this can happen on an isolated basis because the services are isolated on their own. Um, the last point, low viscosity uh, instead of uh, prescriptions. Mm, just as a reminder, viscosity as a concept uh, introduced by Robert C. Martin, he says um, that um, uh, you have normally more than one choice or more than um, um, uh, 
uh, more than one way um, to actually make a change. Um, you have one that preserves design and you have a quick hack or uh, something that, well, quick is the word that is uh, quite important here. You have a hack, something that is not preserving the design. Um, and he says um, that in um, high viscosity systems, the hack is the easier way to do, so it's a quick hack. Um, and this, uh, the, the thing that preserves the design is the hard way. Um, and that's why we need governance. We need, well, not the sole purpose, but um, we need more governance if uh, the right way is the hard way because we need to, um, to actually see if people are doing that. Um, if it would be the easiest way to do, um, we need less control mechanism mechanisms because the easiest way um, is the, the thing that people do anyway. Um, they uh, wouldn't just um, do another thing uh, because of uh, laziness. Yeah? They do it because they have a responsibility. Perhaps they don't meet their goals in performance or whatever. So what does Netflix actually do um, to, to get this low viscosity? Um, one thing is that they have a own platform on top of um, Amazon Web Services that abstracts it. Um, and um, they try to make the platform more robust, flexible, and glitch-free, as they uh, call it. Um, and it's much easier to use Amazon Web Services if you use this concert of tools that they provide you. There are many, many, many of these tools, and uh, lots of them are open sourced. Um, the most um, um, recognized ones are perhaps the Simeon Army um, or Hystrix, um, the uh, circuit breaker implementation. You have uh, lots of things that actually collect metrics for you and so on. So lots of lots of stuff um, and when you go to the blueprint of what a service looks like um, using these services you have all these colored uh, things here are standard um, um, things from this um, Netflix stack. Um, so when you're making an edge service something that is customer facing um, you can um, um, rely on some things that uh, perhaps log for you um, or that um, try to make your um, uh, remote communication um, something that is resilient and restful um, and um, these tools here abstract it uh, in a way that is very easy for you uh, to achieve uh, your goals actually. Um, you also have here um, uh, something that is out of the box uh, communication to Cassandra with REST services and so on. So when you're doing business stuff, you want to create a new service, you get lots of stuff around there and there are technology choices that are baked in. Um, you have REST in there, you have Cassandra in there, you have a, um, a, a registry uh, that is there. Um, so when you are um, doing the, most, the, the easiest thing there, you're adhering to the standard technology choices that there are. Um, if you are um, trying to deviate, you can. Freedom and responsibility, of course. Do something that you want, but it will be harder and you uh, still need to be as reliable as uh, the other services. So you need to uh, get a lot of uh, uh, stuff together. And most of the time, only the very brave and um, very motivated people actually do that. And that is the source of innovation. So this is an important concept and it's actually not only something that microservices can do. It is possible for every architecture out there to do something like it. Um, so what you get is you um, have um, lower skill requirements for people that come in. You have faster time to market because um, you don't have to um, invent the wheel over, all over again um, when you're doing new services. The downside, of course, is the overhead. Um, you have overhead uh, to get the technical stuff right and you have also um, um, overhead for a project to actually establish what the real way is. So um, what is the things, the choices that we want to bake in? Uh, what is the easiest way that you want to provide? This is something that uh, actually has uh, to be worked on. So um, they don't. Uh, reusability and centralization is, is, is no-go. So uh, these are words that are uh, in, in, in classical management, but not in, in Netflix sense. And they optimize for speed. They always say they optimize for speed, and reuse is something that is not good for speed. Um, I, I can elaborate a little bit more on that, but it, it's, uh, it's uh, perhaps a longer discussion. The last thing I want to say is that uh, the deployment at Netflix. Deployment? It's a very important part uh, because there is a coordination problem. You have lots of people that want to deploy something, and the question is how. Um, 
how do we um, actually answer the complexity that is in there? And the answer is you don't. Um, I call it assisted anarchy. Um, it's like um, you, you um, uh, make an environment that puts people into the position um, that they can actually work it out on themselves um, without causing major harm. Um, so they have approximately 100 deployments a day. Teams are self-governing. They have no separate QA, and um, there is no coordination um, uh, about these releases. Um, and how do they do it? I won't discuss it in, t in detail, but you have an old version of your service here, and um, you have a new version of your service that is um, packaged and deployed here. When the new service is ready, it's uh, not that the old service isn't unavailable right, right away. Um, it's just tested with, with a few calls, and it, uh, there's a monitoring and logging uh, part going on um, that actually looks at if the thing is doing the same thing as before, um, and then you put more and more and more um, uh, requests on it to see um, if it's uh, also scalable enough. Um, and only then the old service is actually um, uh, undone. So this is something that is most favorable in a cloud environment, of course. It's something that is hard to do in a data center, uh, but it's a concept that actually gives you some upsides. Um, fast rollback, which is actually a fallback then, um, and you get very little users in contact with failure. Few, not nobody, but few of them. Um, and actually, Netflix is, does a pretty good job. They have more reliability than the platform they're using, which is pretty amazing. Well, none? Yeah, it is, huh? okay. Um, so the hard part, infrastructure, of course, observability, coordination, all these things um, are something that um, they tackle with culture and uh, stuff that goes in there. So in summary, um, we have lots of more uh, topics covered in our uh, architecture evaluations, and I have just um, I have, uh, talked about the, the, the most um, dominant stuff here and the most um, on, on the surface. But the things that always come on top is maintainability, where uh, you have um, stuff is changed and added pretty quickly uh, to the system. They optimize for speed, and uh, this is uh, something you see. They uh, say the fastest way to ship code is to occasionally ship bugs, which is it, it says uh, something about this one here. Uh, reliability is also a high target because they invest lots and lots of money and, um, and uh, um, technology parts to actually get this. Um, usability could be even higher uh, because they sometimes um, even um, have trade-offs to maintainability to make it the system more usable. Um, so the other stuff is something that is perhaps not that important. For the constraints, so what constraints do you sh should you have to make this environment work? Um, you should have a long-lived product. If you have something that is developed once and then you have a maintainability team or something that is scaled down, um, they will not actually um, uh, make good work with, the, with this complex system. Um, ownership is something that isn't um, uh, working very, very well. So um, you will have a product idea um, you have to work with. The size of the project uh, or the product should be big enough to have several teams. Otherwise, the autonomy you gain is something that is not that important, I guess. Um, Self-organizing and management should be something that is not, uh, well, that is in harmony, let's say it that way. Um, deployment in the cloud is feasible. This should be possible for you to make some of the aspects work. Uh, and failing during deployment or release should be possible. So um, if we have like, you NASA guys here, um, this would be a, perhaps a, a, a no-go for you. Um, and using integrating open source solutions is easy. This is something um, um, that also, if you prevent this, you have to build all of this stuff on your own, which would be very, very hard. Um, and um, well, Netflix has done it, but they invest lots of lots of money and resources. Um, they want to get the biggest and the brightest to, just to, to, to make this work. I have five trade-offs um, to sum it up. And um, the more important thing is on top, the other one on bottom. Technology decisions at team level and local experiments to help reaching quality goals are more important than a homogeneous system landscape with high integrity. So reuse, not so important. Um, more important is technology experiments and quality achievement in sense of um, uh, new features and um, new features quickly, uh, high reliability. Second one, innovation and growth are very important aspects of software development. 
control, central planning and transparent status for management are clearly inferior motives. So um, you don't want to make everything transparent. More important is that uh, you have non-centralized innovation going on. So bright people making good decisions, um, um, making uh, you a great company. Fast development and delivery of new functionality is more important than the complete lack of bugs and problems in production. Um, again, yeah. Uh, <laughs> to reach high quality for the user and the benefits that are um, corresponding um, makes redundant development and low reuse possible is perfectly okay. And the last one, high initial overhead for frameworks, components, automation, infrastructure abstractions are justifiable just to make uh, the, the solution long-term suitable and up-to-date all the time. Um, so if you say yes to all of these microservices and the Netflix approach is perhaps something of you, uh, something for you. If you say no, 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 I don't know, um, then perhaps you should overthink your approach there. Um, but um, nevertheless, if you have some yes, some no, just work with it. Um, I have some more material in the slides you will get afterwards. Um, my name is Stefan Toth and I thank you. <laughs>